Hi, welcome back to another episode of Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We have an interesting set of circumstances in Colorado this year. You'll remember about this time last year, we were going through all the redistricting. And so we have kind of all new races this this uh, legislative session um, coming up because there's new maps. And so part of that is for the first time maybe ever, Col- or Pueblo County has its own um, state seat. So it's just all of Pueblo County is one state seat. So that's the race. And we're here with Nick Heinrichsen, who um, has been filling that seat since uh, Leroy Garcia left. Um, he got a cool job at the Pentagon, and he was the Senate president. Um, and he'd been representing uh, Pueblo for a really long time yep. on a lot of levels. And so he announced he was leaving because he was termed out anyway. And so all of this other stuff. So, Nick, thanks for sitting down with us today. We wanted to just sort of um, talk out some of these things. We we hear a lot of questions on how all of that works. And we want to get to know you a little bit better um, and uh, talk about what it's like to just get thrown into a really big seat in the middle of toward the end of a session and all of that. So welcome. Tell us, um, Nick, a little bit about you and your background and and how you came to be where you're what you're doing today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, you know, what Action 22 does for Southern Colorado. And, um, you know, it, it's great to be here. I um I cut my teeth after college in the military. I was an Army officer, um, Army transportation officer. And um, once I was done with my active duty time, um, went it, it carried over nicely into the trucking industry, and I worked there for a few years. Um, the one thing that I really missed um, being in the trucking industry was a, a sense of, you know, the Army gave me a sense of there was something more than myself and something more than a paycheck. Um, you know, I was serving a greater good. And uh, while I very much enjoyed the trucking industry, um, I, I really wanted to have that feeling when I went to work every day. And uh, so I got my master's degree in public administration and uh, was able to then make a pretty smooth transition into working in public transit. Right. Um, and I've been working at Pueblo Transit uh, since then. And, um, you know, just been involved in, in a lot of, you know, the transportation issues that we're, we're facing here in Southern Colorado. And um, knowing that Senator Garcia was term limited, I, you know, decided that I, I want to run for that seat because I want to uh, to fight for those issues at the Capitol. And uh, the whole, the way the vacancy committee happened, uh, it was very, very interesting uh, and very um, uh, hectic experience. Um, but, it was nice because I'd already been in the race for three months. I'd been following mm-hmm. what the uh, state legislature was doing. And um, when Senator Garcia announced his vacancy, there was two weeks between that announcement and the vacancy uh, committee selection. Um, and then from there, uh, just a week before I was sworn in, and then, um, you know, it, then it's go time. So, uh being already in the campaign and being, you know, having a close eye on what was going on in Denver, um, you know, helped me a, a significant amount in being able to understand what was going on and be able to just jump into the fray of things. Right. So I have to tell you, um, Brian and I are both kind of civics nerds. So we are, we love the process and we've had a lot of questions. Will you walk us through? So when you have a sitting legislator resign their seat, tell us about how that works in Colorado. Yeah, so in Colorado, uh, the party who last held the seat fills the seat through a vacancy committee. And uh, in this case, you know, the, the Pueblo County bylaws, uh, you know, was that every every precinct captain, every member of the central committee from a, a precinct in the district uh, got a vote on it. That was about 155 uh, people. Um, so, you know, we had a election with 155 uh, party members who were active enough to at least be precinct chairs mm-hmm. uh, have have votes on it, and um, we, we've actually now since standardized it. That's the way it's going to work um, when future vacancies like this this occur throughout the state. And um, you know, I, I like that because it uh, is consistent 
you know, create some consistency and it's fair. Um, you know, we see in so many states where um, a republic or a, a governor just appoints the uh, the vacancy. You know, if mm-hmm. you have a Republican vacancy and a Democratic governor, and they appoint a Democrat, it's not necessarily fair to the people who elected a Republican. Mm-hmm. Same vice versa. Um, in other states where there is a special election, it's very, very costly and right. very time consuming. You often go the the entire legislative session um, without a representative, and, yeah. and that's not fair to the people of of that area. So um, there's no perfect way. Uh, if 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 we had found that, um, I'm sure we'd all be doing it. But uh, I, I think Colorado's is very efficient and and it is fair. So no, I agree with you. It's um Especially when you're talking about if it was a, a full year or something, but we're talking about 120 day sessions and not not that much left in a session to have a special election for that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it, it can work. So so my question is, how chaotic was it? Because I think, you know, you got appointed, say, Friday and then you started work on Monday, correct? <laughs> yeah. So it was it, see, it was uh, it was Saturday, um, Saturday that I got appointed um, Monday was a, a holiday. So I okay. actually, um, oh, that's right. Tuesday, Monday that. was Martin Luther King day, uh, Tuesday through Thursday. I was up there just shadowing and, and, you know, going to committee meetings and mm-hmm. meeting with, um, you know, all sorts of stakeholders and, and, and have trying to have conversations before I jumped in. And then it was the next Monday after that I was sworn in and, um, February twenty eighth. So, so it's literally trial by fire. They just kind of throw you yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <clears throat> cool. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, also, with that, so you had the advantage, like you said, of kind of following the policies and and knew where you know everything was going. So when you got up there, when you when you f- were first sworn in, um, was it a shock to you how it works, how fast it is, um, or was it something that you were already aware of? It, it was something that I was aware of. Um, you know, I I had been involved in politics uh, a bit before. I um, you know, in high school, I did an internship with my congressman, and then um, I was pretty involved. I, mean, I got my undergrad degree was in poli sci, and then I just I wasn't as involved anymore as I was in the military and mm-hmm. you know um, raising a kid and um, in private industry and and but um, you know I had some familiarity with that. My wife is a uh, former state representative, so I had some understanding um, through her. Um, I, I had a good idea what I was getting into. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to bring up later hockey because I know you're an avid supporter of our hockey team here. I am. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll I didn't talk. Know that. We'll, we'll get we'll through get the, the boring hockey. stuff yeah. first. This uh, is to keep the listeners on, so we'll talk hockey after this. Yeah. So let me ask you. Um, so it was quick, it was fast and furious. Um, it was February, so you were about halfway through the session, not quite. We were 48 days in and 72 days left. Oh, yeah. Not that so, I was counting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was, we, we don't either, by the way. <laughs> what was the thing? No, not at all. What was the thing that, um, that, you f- that surprised you most in those first initial days? Um. I think I think sometimes just the pace of it um, was, um, and maybe even even to the degree of the inconsistency of the pace of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, my wife and I joke all the time, and more and more and more and more that it, we get deja vu to back in my time in the military, in the legislature for so many reasons. You know, one, you're away from from your family for you know granted this is only a week at a time instead of extended periods um you know there's some hostilities obviously it's way more civil at the legislature um there's high stakes um but one of the things that that just there is a there are periods of go 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 and there are periods where you you hurry up and wait um, because you're waiting on a, a committee to um to decide on a bill or you're waiting on another chamber to decide on a bill or you're getting guidance from the governor's office and if they're going to veto a bill and, you know, um, could there be changes that, that would um, change that, that dynamic? Um, so 
you know, sometimes it's very, very rapid, and sometimes it's um, it's very, very slow. Yeah, I, I joked um, when I first came on with Action Twenty Two. I came from the the federal side of things, and it's like, ah, eh, we got two years to work on this. It moves slow, and then we <laughs> we do. And I was never really involved with the the state um, politics or legislation that much. But then we're like, I kind of got thrown into is like, holy cow, there's that many bills. Like it's boom, 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 boom. But then you're right. There's the hurry up and wait part compared to the federal side where it's like, hey, we're going to introduce this bill. Maybe we're going to talk about it a year down the road. So that gives us time to prepare for it. The state, you don't have the luxury of time when it comes to this stuff. No, no, you don't. So 700 bills in 120 day session. This, um, this session was a little bit different than sessions we've seen in the past, I think, because so much got put off till the very end. So when the session first started, so many legislators um, either got COVID or ha- they had to quarantine, and so they had to kind of push stuff back, push stuff back, push stuff back. And then it was that back and forth on a whole lot of things. This was a weird session for you to get into the middle of. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of, the, if that's okay, a little bit about some of the legislation. You did a really good job, I have to tell you, of reaching out. You called me when I called you. You answered right away. We talked when I saw you, We and we talked about um, some different things. I, I think um, you called me on, I want to say it was 1362. It was the um, building codes one. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though you and I didn't agree on it, we we understood each other. Because one of the things that I was really worried about that I saw the trend for this last session was um, the move away, the steady move away from the stakeholder process. But you really tried to stick with that. Ultimately, um, we were not on the same side for 1362. I understood why. But there were some other bills that you were – that we kind of came together on that you, I mean, you didn't, you didn't vote straight down party line. You were trying to figure out what was going to work, right? What was, I can't remember what some of the other bills, I know that you worked on a ton. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think your 1218 is something that I think we discussed a little bit. That was another building codes one okay, um, yep. that, that was um, for apartment complexes, mostly apartment condominium complexes, um, and it had significant requirements around electrical vehicle charging stations oh, yeah. uh, being installed. So I better go walk back and the 1362, and I think it's 1362 because we worked on 1362 and 1363, which were very different bills, but I keep getting the numbers mixed up. 1362 with the building code would be a um, statewide required building code that would um, have eliminated any, any new buildings or remodels um, that there would be um, – no natural gas in those. So that's, so when I get, I get kind of chewed out every once in a while because I'll, I'll throw out a bill and I'll say, this is what it was. And then they're like, what bill are you talking about? Because from one year to the next, you can't remember the numbers on them. So there's that. And then the 1218 was something that you really came to the center on. Um, 1218, what else? Um, so 1244 was a, a air toxin bill mm-hmm. um, that I, um, you know, I, I, Worked with some parties on amendments for um, right. we we um, changed the scope of that bill. And you and I talked um, about this one at great length too. Yeah, and and the concern there is that in its original language, it, it created some uncertainty uh, for a lot of um, businesses, including Evraz here in Pueblo, mm-hmm. um, because it, it allowed for more rapid changes in the technology used in the collection of air toxic samples or air toxin samples, excuse me. Um, and, um, greater rapid fire flexibility of, of rulemaking around what toxins could be, uh, regulated and how those, uh, could be implemented. And, uh, so we, we essentially, what we did is we, we scaled that back and provided some consistency of, you know, that once a rule went into effect for what type of, um, equipment you're using for, uh, sampling collection that, that you could reliably be authorized to use that equipment mechanism for, um, you know, for a certain period of time and that you, um, you know, once rules were, rule changes were proposed, it would go back to the legislature, uh, so that there was an oversight process, mm-hmm. um, and that stuff wasn't being, uh, change at such a rapid pace and without the input of, of those involved. Um, I think, you know, really this kind of goes, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit. My philosophy on governance is, I think, pretty simple. Um, 
I believe that that part of what makes America so great um, is this idea that whoever you are, uh, wherever you, you come from, whatever your family background or whatever, um, if you work hard and you play by the rules, you're a generally decent person, you can make it. And you, you know, there's no promise that you're going to get rich. If you do, God bless you, great. Uh, but if you if you play by the rules, um, work hard, you know, meet your obligations, are, are a decent person, that you you can carve out a life for yourself mm-hmm. and for your family. And the frustrating thing is that we're we're losing that. For so many people, we're losing that. So when I look at legislation. Whatever it is, I look at how does this, um, how does this meet that end? And so um, sometimes that's competing stuff. You know, when, yeah. we're, when we're dealing with um, issues of air quality, um, you know, being able to breathe healthy air, uh, stuff that, that deals with uh, climate change, um, that's stuff that affects working families. But also, when we're trying to address it, and and the way we address it puts a greater burden right. on on you know the affordability of of new housing. When housing affordability is in a crisis right now, um, well, that's that's problematic too. So that's how I approach each of these issues and um, try to work to to see where we could build a consensus. Well, and I think that's what I appreciated about uh, most about you. A lot of because there's, again, 700 bills and you're trying to get through everything. You and I stopped and we had this exact conversation. And it wasn't an easy one. Um, and, you know, we didn't, I wasn't, you know, because you're our legislator, I wasn't easy on you or anything, but it, that was the thing that we discussed is when, you know, there's a tipping point where adding burden, when you're voting for legislation that adds burden with no quantifiable gain, um, that's what makes it really hard. But these are a lot of the bills that were introduced this last session where they are trying to accomplish this without regard to the burden that was added. And you really worked hard to remind everybody, especially um, in light of, which, you know, let's address climate change, but how much damage are you doing with that? And you did a great job, I thought, of trying to figure out some kind of consensus um, on that. And it wasn't easy. I know that, I know that, uh, um, you know, you were the you were the new guy, and so there was again a lot of stuff getting thrown on you. Who did you find to be really um, productive allies for you while you were up there? Who was it that really sort of, you know, brought you along and helped you through all all of this, trying to get through this crazy, crazy session? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I love about our state is um, we have so many people who care about our state. Uh, they're in the legislature and they're they're not. And there is no shortage of people who have expertise in their fields and you know, public servants who who really uh, give value to to the issues that we're we're dealing with and and give expertise to them and are eager to see Colorado be you know the wonderful place to live that it is. I think we do that. You know, that's just a human thing. You can't measure that, but I think we do that better than a lot of other states do. We're People love this state and care about this state, and uh, so it was. It was always meeting with people, um, you know, from from our universities or our nonprofits, um, people from you know entrepreneurs and business leaders who had insights that were, were valuable to the process. Um, you know, within the legislature, um, so many. I was just welcomed with open arms. Um, Senator Donovan knows rural issues so mm-hmm. well. Um, I had the privilege of, of sitting next to her and a wealth of, of knowledge learned from her. Um, Senator Simpson uh, knows water better than anybody in the legislature. Um, I had a couple of long conversations with him that were, um, I learned a lot from him. Um, uh, and, and But it was, it was a great experience. There were, there were a lot of great people involved. There, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so right now, um, the people, the the average person on the street, they really think that it's divided. Like, obviously, that there's this rhetoric out there saying, you know, this is the most divided we've ever been as Americans. Um, and we see it. And I, I blame, we've talked about it a lot. I mm-hmm. blame the media, both sides of the media on this a lot, just kind of stoking the fire for views and clicks. But 
Did you see that when you were up at the legislature? Is it truly polarized like the average person sees, or are you working together with the other legislators across the aisle? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yes and no. I, I, I think um, we are fortunate. Again, we have collaboration in this state much better than other states do, and I pray that we never lose that. Um, because that does mean we get better governance uh, out of it. I, I feel like we are slipping backwards a little bit. Um, it's not, you know, I think at the federal level, we've entirely gone way too far with that. Um, it, but I agree. It, but it, it does, it does um, there is a different feel, um, and, and meaningfully so, when you're at the Colorado State Capitol versus if you're at the, uh, the Capitol in D.C., um, it hasn't totally gone away yet. There's still a lot of collaboration and there is a lot of, um, you know, there is a lot of effort to, uh, you know, to meet mutually and to have these conversations and to, to do right by the people of Colorado. Um, you know, the one, I think your media plays a role in it. I think, um, you know, we need to be better as, um, bumper sticker slogans, um, and bumper sticker (laughs) politics are a problem, Yes. Across the spectrum, and um, you know, so so whenever you have people offer bumper sticker solutions to problems, you should be concerned with that um, because, like we were just talking about, Sarah. I mean, there's there's um, the problems that we face are not simple, and no. and they and they require complex solutions, and they require balancing acts. And uh, if, if we're going to do them right, if we're going to do them right by the people of Colorado. So um, the further we get away from that, the more we we get into some dangerous territory. I agree with you. What's the, what's the bumper sl- sticker slogan that you just despise the most? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm going to ask you this in a second, so be thinking. <laughs> Let me think about that. I can only, God, a, yeah. I can only pick one. Um, yeah, pick two. I, I um, oh, I don't know. Um, there's, uh, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> I don't, I, um, so let me let me actually elaborate on that a little bit. Um, you know. I um in, in my younger years I I I started out as a Republican and in my twenties my my politics you know I, I spent a lot of my twenties trying to figure out oh my gosh I'm an adult now what do I believe you what do I understand of the world and I you know I got there and um I'm comfortable you know I, I know who I am now um but I remember being a, a volunteer you know in, in 2004 in, in in the Bush campaign and um. The, the world is, is so different. Um, you know, people people were passionate about their beliefs, and people should be passionate mm-hmm. about their beliefs. Um, there were ways that we did that civilly. Um, you know, obscenities or euphemisms for obscenities was not a part of our, of our dialogue. Um, politics, towards politicians mm-hmm. or towards each other as individuals, um, and, you know, being able to, to talk constructively, um, about issues, um, you know, and, and, and having a, a respect for facts and, and data, um, allowed us to learn from each other. And I think that's something we need to get back to. So, um, so let's go. Brandon is my <laughs> Brian, what's one do you, that you hate? Two of them. So I hate the generic ones, and it's both sides of the aisle. It's like, vote blah, blah, blah for freedom. And you see it yeah. on both sides, oh, and yeah. it's like, that that can mean anything. But the one that gets me, and it goes back to, like, the more, um, you know, not proper ways, but you, if you remember, there was the shirts that said, not my president, right? And it, right. And it had George, George W. Bush on it. And then... All the, you know, the Republicans are like, you can't say that. He is your president. But then you go to the other side, and then it'll be like, not my president with Trump. And then they get mad. And it's so funny because they're willing to do it for this one, not this one. And then both sides just get mad at each other for the same reasons over the whole thing. It's like, well, if you dish it out, you got to learn how to take it too. But 
I hate those generic, like really, really generic bumper stickers that are political. That's what I don't like. I, I, That's fair. I will say, you know, one of the, my dad is not a political man, mm-hmm. um, but he, when I was first getting involved, he, you know, he, he was a great, he's a great dad. He, uh, you know, he supported me and, you know, pushed me to, to pursue, you know, what, what I was passionate about. Um, but he, he had some insights for somebody who really isn't involved in politics mm-hmm. that, that I keep with me to this day. And one of them, he said that the political spectrum is a circle. Mm-hmm. And once you go too far, either way, you arrive at the same spot yes. because, because it's a circle. Yes. You're wise. just at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and we saw that with, it, it was really weird. And I saw it and we'd always joke. It's like you have the kind of the really far right people and the really far left people. And then over 10 years, you kind of saw them meeting up and like COVID was a perfect example, you know, where you had the anti-vaxxer versus the pro-vaxxers and anti-masking. It, it was not political anymore. They all kind of wound up in the same spot on the circle at the end of the day, mm-hmm. which was interesting. Or how to how to manage that too. That was another yeah, thing that yeah. we saw. So you had somebody that you would think would, you know, push towards one side and they ended up pushing towards the other. It, it was interesting. You're, that was That's yeah. wise of your dad. I appreciate that. So... Um, you didn't have a primary opponent, which I always hated primary season because it is bumper sticker politics basically during a primary. And then once you get out of that, then you could start focusing on the issues more and more. Um, going out and talking to people, people that aren't even politically involved, uh, the number one concern on their mind right now is the economy. You've heard it. Everything's too expensive. How can we afford to live? That ties into housing and everything, gas prices and safety. So being a candidate, now that you are running for office, um, what some ideas do you have to address that, not only in Pueblo, but Colorado as a whole, to make it more affordable for people to live here, to, to let them pay for their gas and afford gas instead of giving up a meal, and also to, to make it safer in our communities because it's not just a Pueblo issue. I think across the board with everything going on right now, um, safety is a concern, and, and we're seeing some stuff happen in our communities right now that's concerning to me with children. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the great questions. And we're hearing the same things. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing it's, uh, you know, it's affordability, it's, uh, it's public safety. Uh, and I'm hearing the third thing that I'm hearing is, you know, the Denver just doesn't understand Southern Colorado. And I feel that and get that too. That's all Action 22. That's yeah, what right. That's, that's, ex- that's exactly <laughs> why you, you, your organization exists. Uh, I'm grateful it does. Um, um you know, we're and, and we're we're at a really interesting point because um, you know we hit record revenues this last year, and um, you know if you if you measure by unemployment, we're doing great. If you measure by per capita GDP, Colorado is doing phenomenal. Um, but if you ask the average person uh, in your neighborhood, you know how are they doing? They're struggling. If you mm-hmm. ask the average family-owned business, how they're doing, they're struggling. They're not seeing that. Mm-hmm. And um, I, one of the one of my proudest accomplishments in this session, uh, I, I ran the bill that gave the, um, or that set up the um, the relief checks that everybody is getting, $750 for, for an individual, uh, $1,500 for uh, a family. Um, and we, it, it comes out of the Tabor mechanism, but it changes it in some fundamental ways. One, rather than getting it on your tax return, um, you get it as soon as uh, the taxes can be processed at the state level and the checks can be printed, and it, they'll go in the mail um, here in the next month to you. So otherwise, that money would just sit in an account that gains about 2% interest, which is less than inflation, and you get it when you file your taxes next year. So we're getting it to you as soon as possible, about eight months sooner than it would normally go. The second thing is by making a flat check, um, it goes to, you know, for a, a family of four in Pueblo uh, that that makes about $90,000 a year, that's going to be about $500 more than what they would have under a traditional mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this is money that people have paid through taxes. This is, um, this is money that's already out there. It's not new. You know, nothing's being printed. Mm-hmm. Um, but that hopefully um, can ease some of the burden that, that some of the families are feeling when they go to the grocery store uh, and when they go to buy gas. Um, I 
worked on a, a bill that suspended Colorado had scheduled to go to a uh, a ten percent hike in um, in our fuel tax, um, and we suspended that. I, I ran the bill that suspended that, um, given what's going on with with gas prices. Um, Anything that that would add to that burden is not appropriate for for Colorado families. I uh, would like to extend that suspension uh, next year. Um, so so that's something that I, I definitely want to do going forward. Uh, and then I looked at a bunch. We we did where we could uh, in a lot of different places piecemeal. Um, I was proud to run a bill that um, has suspended entirely. Uh, license fees for nurses uh, and we have a huge nursing shortage here in southern colorado um and that's you know a little bit of a burden where you know, people are are you know they're they're hundred dollar plus fees um so the and barriers to getting into the profession um so we've suspended that um and um you know those are those are some of the things that we're we're doing on the cost uh level on the public safety, um, one of the things that I want to do is, and then again, you're, this is all over the state, but this is Pueblo specific too. Um, we have a, a thing called Palpo, uh, possession of a weapon by a prior offender. Uh, every state has it. Um, every state implements it a little differently. And what it is is that for felony crimes, uh, state can take away for a period of up to 10 years upon conviction uh, your rights to own um, or possess uh, a weapon. Um, and in Colorado, we implement that for uh, for violent crimes with, with convictions. Um, we don't for other felonies. I would like to see aggravated motor vehicle theft, which is classified, and, and rightfully so, as a property crime, onto that list because motor vehicle theft so often, um, even though it's a, a crime on its own, it's so often connected with some of the gang violence that we're seeing. And it's the number one crime in, in conversations I've had with Chief Noller where, you know, there's just an uneasy feeling that there's going to be, there's going to be other stuff later. So what, what adding that to the Palpo list does, a few things. When somebody is convicted uh, of felony aggravated motor vehicle theft, um, we can say you don't, you know, you, you lose the rights to possess a, a dangerous weapon for for ten years. Obviously, that doesn't mean that necessarily that a person is going to follow that. But if they are have an interaction, if they're stopped by the police, uh, you know, say, and, and a weapon is present, they can be arrested for that. And they can be charged for that. If they do get their hands on a weapon and they, um, you know, are, are involved in a criminal activity later, then there's an additional charge that can make the punishment more severe for that. So that's something that I want to, to, to really see going forward and something that I've been eager to, to put forward in the next legislative session. So that's a very Colorado thing, right? So we're the Wild West. Like, we are a Wild West state back go back to the cowboy days and that was the death penalty if you stole a man's horse it was the death penalty not suggesting that should be the death penalty <laughs> for still in a car but the reason why it was the horse was that person's livelihood and it was also used in crime if it was stolen and that's why that was such a bad crime to commit in the the olden days i guess you would say so no that's true and i've had my i've had a car stolen me too and Twice. it's <laughs> It wasn't, you know, it, it really, it's more, it's more damaged than you think to have your car stolen. Um, but I have to say, you know, and this is prior to your appointment, but um, we've heard a lot from, and, I, and again, this is the opinion of Sarah, but um, I have to, I have to sort of um, agree with uh, our current DA, Jeff Chosner, when he's, um, expressed a lot of frustration with the rise in crime rates. And it's not just him that we've heard this from, but on some of the legislation that happened, not in the 22 session, but in the 20, the 21 session. Um, would you, is that something that, that you feel pretty passionately about? Or you know, as far as like a lot of this rise in crime, 
we need to go back and, and to fix some of these things that happened in this legislature before you were even there. Yeah. Because you're catching the heat for it. I, I am, yeah. And and I and I actually do, you know, I mean, just an email I sent out to somebody a couple days ago, he was, um, you know, somebody was, you know, said, well, how could you vote this way on, I forget if it was 217 or 271. I'm like, a, I'm happy to tell you I didn't. I wasn't <laughs> I there wasn't yet. I wasn't there yet, um, yeah. But uh, we, we did... Uh, I want to say it was 1257 was a important first step. Uh, 1257 was a consensus bill that rolled back a lot of the uh, changes that happened a couple of years ago. I don't think it gets us to where we need to be, but it creates a better foundation that we can build upon. Um, and so I, I supported that. What uh, was that? What was 1257? 1257 was the... Um, Let me look it up. Um, it was a, a bill that um, accepted recommendations of the um, CCJJ, uh, the Colorado Criminal and Juvenile Justice uh, mm-hmm. Coalition. Uh, so sort of in the aftermath of, of the bills of, of years past, um, you know, there's there's been this sort of get-together of criminal justice reform advocates, um, law enforcement uh, leaders, um, you know, victims' rights advocates, everybody in, involved in the whole process and said, okay, well, what, what can we agree on? And there was a lot that was agreed upon in their meetings that sort of scaled back what was done in 217 and 271. So we adopted that into law. And I think that puts us in a, in a better, solid footing to where we can build upon and go forward in a meaningful way, and you know, have better conversations about um, what we're, um, you know, how how can we adequately uh, address these issues? Because again, they're also complex, mm-hmm. and oh, no um, doubt. and we have issues with with jail overcrowding, and we have issues of, of reform where you know. We're, we're having higher recidivism than we should ever have. And so there's so many aspects of, you know, how do we adequately uh, punish people for, for the crimes they commit? How do we, um, you know, administer justice in a way that truly reforms the individual? How do we, you know, do justice not just to, to punish people for crimes, but to also make our communities safer? Um, those are all elements of that. And, uh you know, I, I mentioned Papa because I think that's that's one way specifically where I, I want to be involved in, in doing that. I also, you know, worked, um, you know, I, I, I ran House Bill 1243 in the Senate. Um, that works to reduce school violence. Uh, it creates more funding than we've ever seen in the past for, um, uh, for counseling and behavioral health in our uh, high schools and middle schools. Um, Senate Bill uh, 1. Uh, I jumped on. It was a, a Senator Garcia bill, and I did, really liked it and took over uh, my first day uh, when I was there. Um, that works. To, how can we um, resolve sort of deficiencies in our public sphere in a way where people are safer when they're out and about in the community, uh, better lighting, um, you know, safer barriers, uh, better, you know, infrastructure, um, because – all crimes problematic, right? But mm-hmm. I think uh, what's particularly horrible is is the the violent crimes, and then crimes that are just so random. You know, an, an assault on a on a, a street corner of somebody walking to to the store or something. So that that works to address those areas. Um, you know, I've worked on very involved in issues such as those. So going further into that, um, homelessness is a problem as well, and we hear that, uh, and, and it's in all the, the towns. But it seems to me, and I've been dealing with this for years, and I've been going to these meetings where you have every nonprofit, every government agency from the municipality on up to the state, and everybody seems to have a different solution or a different idea about it. But what they do to me, it looks like they're just throwing money at it and it's not getting any better. We're not seeing any real solutions to homelessness here in Colorado, specifically Pueblo. We'll just say Pueblo. What do you recommend? And this, this could be a local issue that wouldn't be in your, um, you know, your, your portfolio dealing 
dealing with it on a state side, but what's some ideas you have to address this homeless problem that we're seeing in Pueblo and around the state? I think um, homelessness is, is often, um, you know, it, it's married to uh, substance addictions mm-hmm. and um, it's, it's married to unstable housing. Uh, and so I think that we need to, um, and, and I think part of the problem is these are local issues, but they require coordination. We don't do the coordination piece well. Um, and uh, so um, we took, we, we'd invested more in um, substance abuse rehabilitation and uh, harm reduction uh, methods for individuals with substance abuse than we ever have in the past. I think that was one of the great accomplishments mm-hmm. of this last legislative session. I am optimistic that we will see benefit in numerous areas on that. That in in in, in just the sheer addiction and um, I- individual struggle that you see there uh, in crime rates in. Homelessness. I think. I think that will have impacts that far you know, go be far beyond uh, the initial sphere there. And I think that we need to really be serious about affordable housing. Mm-hmm. And affordable housing is a, is a, a thing too, where it's a pie, and there are so many different pieces of varying different sizes. Uh, there is no. There is no one piece to solve that puzzle. Uh, there's so many aspects involved in it, and um, we can't just focus on our favorite one. Um, we, we have to address that in a, um, in a complex manner. So it's an affordability plus accessibility. It's for affordability, accessibility, right. yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit. Um, I, I think it takes, um, I'm going to be kind and say, I think it takes a special kind of person to be willing to run for office, the unkind is I think it's a little crazy to run for mm-hmm. office. You've got to have a lot of love for where you're at. What do you love? And, and you know, you you. I didn't realize this till today. You listen to all of our shows. So, you know, Brian and I are all about this region and area. And, you know, so he's Mr. Pueblo over here and, and you know, all of that. What is it that you love about Pueblo? I'm curious is, is if we're going to align on the things that we love the most about Pueblo. So there's so much to unpack there, and give me one second. You know, Brian, I know we're going to talk about hockey later. My entire time growing up, I played hockey through high wow. school. Yes. All I ever wanted to be from the time I was six was a goalie, and I was told from an early age that you have to be a little crazy to be a goalie, and <laughs> I've, I've been told by all the players of, of the Bulls, you're you're crazy to be a goalie. So you're right, Samantha. I, I, you know, I you, you have to be crazy to be in this. No, uh, I love And it. I embrace that. Um what I love about Pueblo, um, God, there's so many things. I, I love the climate. Um, okay. We are, you know, certain biologists may disagree with me. I believe we're where the desert begins. Um, and I, I love that you can, you know, just between Colorado Springs and here, there's a, a change in the, um, in the biodiversity. Um, I love Lake Pueblo. Um, I love uh, that we are a big enough city uh, and a big enough county where there's always things going on. Um, there's excitement. We have great restaurants. We have uh, you know great venues, and um, and yet it never feels too crowded. Um, we we certainly don't have the traffic congestion of other places. Um, and when you go to explore that that beauty that's around here, um, you can find a hiking trail. My favorite place in the world to go with my son is Kuchara Canyon in, in Werfano County, not far south of here. Yep. There's n- hardly ever do we run into another soul when we're out there. And it's so beautiful. I mm-hmm. love that place. Oh, it, it's, yeah. it's gorgeous. And, and nobody and, knows about it, so forget the name because we don't want you <laughs> there. I'll but edit if, that part out. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, if you, but if you go hiking and look, there's beautiful, we have, we're a beautiful state, and, and I'm not knocking any part of our state, but... It feels like if you do that closer to Denver or in some of the other like well-known mountain towns, you go hiking with your 500 closest friends, right? Yeah. And you don't have that here. So, um, 
and and then you know we've tr- thrown around here in Pueblo for a few years. You know, the gateway of the Southwest. It, it really is, uh, and we have such a, a connection culturally, historically, um, economically, with places like Santa Fe um, that are just American gems. That I, you know, um, they still exist today, and um, so. We live in a great place. We do. I agree. Um, I imagine that, because I do this, um, we do this, at the end of every session, um, we sort of uh, take stock of the things that we wish we could have gotten accomplished. I imagine that when you got through with this session and you're thinking about your campaign, you had a list of this is why I'm running again. So I'm going to ask the big question, why are you running so there's there's more work to be done. Um, I guess there's always going to be work to be done. Um, but you know we're again we're in a challenging time, and um, but we have great opportunities. We, we really do. And I think that for Pueblo, um, you know, a lot of those opportunities align with my passions. Um, so much of our long term growth is going to be, um, you know, how we invest in our and in, in adequately uh, plan for our growth. Um, we're, we're rapidly connecting ourselves to Colorado Springs and we're starting to see some of the growth trickle down here. Um, but that requires a lot of transportation planning, um, a lot of coordination. Uh, that's my background. Uh, I have a lot of you know, passionate views about how we do that adequately. Um, I think we have great capacity at our airport. I'd love to see us expand the industrial park. We have extraordinary capacity at, at our rail yards, and I'd like to see us you know, become an intermodal hub someday. Um, how we build out I-25 and the communities along it is is going to be important so that we can see that uh, economic growth and bring more companies here without the congestion that we see further north on, on 25. Uh, front range passenger rail is going to be uh, critical to our state, but I would argue Pueblo more so than anybody else. Yeah. So, um, you know, these these are long-term issues, and, and there's some immediate issues we're talking about. We're talking about public safety. We're talking about um, inflation. Um, but the, the long-term foundation of where we need to go is so much tied to economic development and transportation. And, um, you know, I... I've been involved in that for years, and and that's where I want to go. And I, I I think I can, you know, help get us where we need to be on that. Yeah. So I have one more issues question because we're hitting about fifty minutes now, and then I got then we'll talk about the fun stuff for a few yeah. minutes. So going back to the bumper sticker slogans, I've heard this from every candidate, every side of the aisle. Education. So you hear it, it's like, we need to talk about education. We need to put the money in the parents' hands. We need more choice for the parents. We need to fund it this way. We need to take away funding from this and put it here, blah, 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 blah. And this also ties into growth in Pueblo because a lot of times um, people will pick their jobs based on the schools there. So with this talk of education from both sides of the aisle, what some ideas you have? What do you think is wrong? What do you think works? And, and what's your plan for education? Uh, great question. Um, so one of another bill I was really proud of is House Bill 1365, Transportation Technology Center uh, created at CSU Pueblo. Mm-hmm. Uh, transportation Technology Centers are something that universities have been doing throughout our country for the last uh, few years, and now they're starting to get traction. And the Biden administration just announced $500 million of uh, federal funding and grants available to these State University Transportation Technology Centers. We don't have one in Colorado, and uh, so well, we do now. We we just mm-hmm. created one at uh, at CSU Pueblo. Uh, I think we're an important part for that because transportation is so critical to our regional development. Uh, because we have the Pueblo Plex here, um, because of the rail infrastructure we have. Um, our airport, uh, you know, might not be a uh, passenger hub. Um, but it's great if you get the chance to use it, you should. Um, but it is uh, an important commercial um, you know, transfer location. So we have we have all the makings of the stuff that's necessary for that, uh, and a shortage of jobs there. I'm you know we're going to be at CSU Pueblo now, uh, uh, taking extraordinary steps to meet the demand there. 
expanding from that, I think one of the things that we need to really be looking at education and something, this is something I really, you know, want to do going forward. This is my, my long-term project is we need to be better at workforce development and not just development, but workforce, uh, sustainment. Mm -hmm. And, um, because we're in a period now where the skills that are necessary today won't be necessary tomorrow. The skills that were necessary yesterday are not necessary today. We have fields today that did not exist yesterday. Right. And, and more so than any point in human history, um, you know, I come from the trucking industry. We have a trucking short or trucker shortage of 80,000 people nationwide, the largest it has ever been since you know, since trucking became an industry, literally. And yet 25 years from now, we are going to, I mean, maybe 20, maybe 30, we are going to have self-driving trucks right. that, that do almost all of that work. Mm -hmm. And so there's a weird thing where, you know, if we need 25, 30-year-olds, 21-year-olds in this industry now. And if, in, if you have it, I mean, there is now... It pays well, and it, it, yeah. it comes with good benefits. And we know that at some point, within the span of, of these people's careers, that job won't be there anymore. So we we need to be focused on, on both the now. We have the shortage. We need to fill it. But we need to get to a point where we have education systems that look down the road and let's get you into trucking now. We need it. It, it can be a great way to, to make it in middle class in America and let's also start planning today for what comes next because we know it's not going to, to be. And let's let's give you the tools so that you can make that decision yourself rather than, you know, you're at a point 25 years and you need a lifeline. Um, and I think that's that's some of the first so much of the frustration of so many workers is they, you know, w when a occupation or skill set um, is obsolete, they, they don't feel like they have control anymore. And, um, and there's nothing, you know, I think there's nothing that gives somebody more pride and sense of individual, you know, worth, individual worth yeah. in, than, than your job and being able to choose what you do and going to work and having the passion about it. Right. So we need to give people the, the resources so they can succeed in that. You know, I, I look at that as education because that's, that is a lifelong thing now. Whereas, you know, even 20 years ago, it was, you know, I was told, go to high school, go to college. Yep. You're good. Right. Yeah, for sure. So, as all of us Colorado people know, this was a big year for hockey here, right? It and, was. And you, you have a vested interest in hockey and Pueblo hockey, so let's talk about Pueblo's hockey team. That Not many people, the word's out there, and but I, I don't think some of our listeners outside of Pueblo are aware of what we have here in Pueblo in terms I may of be getting us. I may be getting us season passes for next year. Yes. Worth it. Very worth I, it. I uh, actually, she's yeah. I'm I'm gonna thinking about getting a season pack in. So the, love it. The uh, the Pueblo Bulls are a, a double A junior team uh, that that uh, well, you know, tier two uh, is a terminology used in junior hockey. These are kids who are um, you know they're they're trying to get their shots to go to either the semi pros or to college mm -hmm. on, on scholarship. Uh, and it's 16 year olds to 20 year olds. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's a blast. And, uh, the team we have here is so involved with the community. Uh, they're always at, uh, at charity events. They're always at public service events. Um, Mario Genasio is, yep. yeah, he's one of our friends over there and he's, I don't know if he's a manager or what he does, but He's did a great job of helping get like that next step promotion and get people excited yeah. about it here. He's done a great job. Um, yeah, and it's um, you know they they interact with the fans. It's a it's a great family event to go it to their fun. games. Um, we you know, we had the privilege. Um, these players come from all over the world. Um, you know we had um, we had kids from Europe, Canada, all over the United States, Alaska. I know Alaska is the United States, but you know it's a, it's a different <laughs> part, right? You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. You it's, almost uh, stepped in it there. It's, you almost um, stepped in it there, Nick. It's um, you know, uh, so we and we hosted a, a, a kid here. So he, the kids will live in billet families, uh, and so uh, we had um, one of their 
their right wingers uh, live with us the uh, the duration series, um, and it's great. I mean, it become it become family, and um, you know, I we we still keep in touch with Kevin. Uh, we're going to keep in touch with Kevin ten years from now, yeah. um, and you know, I, every other. Every other billet family I talk to, it's the same story with with their kid, um, and then it gives you something really passionate about it at the game because you know, darn it, that's your kid. You're cheering yeah. for you know? that kid. Yeah. You're cheering for that kid. Yeah. Uh, remind me when the season starts. Uh, I don't know the exact date. It's October. And it's, then, if our listeners want to find out more about attending a hockey game or just more about it, where can they go? Um, so they play right here at Pueblo Ice Arena down mm-hmm. at. Um, at Court Street and uh, and City Center, um, you can go online. Uh, just Google Pueblo Bulls; it's the first thing that comes up. Um, follow them on Facebook, and um, and yeah, you're you're set. And going into this election season, um, where can our listeners find out more about you as a candidate? So you can go to nickforcolorado.com. That's spelled out F-O-R. Um, you can, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can find me there. And, um, you know, we, we always have active posts about what's going on, where we're at. Um, you, can, you can find me at local Chamber of Commerce events and community events. We're, we're doing stuff every week. So All right. And I, I got to give the disclaimer. Yes. So with that, as we come to an end, um, it's important to note that Action 22 does not support nor endorse candidates. What we do is offer a platform for any Action 22 member running for office to come on and tell us what they're about and talk about the issues with me and Sarah. And yeah. And both the candidates for the seat that Nick is running for um, are Action 22 members. And so um, we'll have everybody on. And, and if you are um, an Action 22 member and you're running for office, regardless of what seat you're after, um, you this is an open invitation for you to come um, and be on the show. Um, is that it? Oh, yeah. Um, if you're not a member, you should be. Go to action22.org to learn more. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, email us at show at action22.org. Again, it's show at action22.org, and we'll get back to you right away. Um, Chad Vorthman, I know you're listening. I have to say this whole mustache gate thing has become um, quite the sensation. I'm just going to give you one word of advice. Not without the sunglasses. Please do not go in public without the sunglasses if you're going to wear that mustache. Oh, I thought that was a dude from Top Gun in that picture. (laughs) It was a dude from Top Gun in that picture. (laughs) um, We'll be back next week. I think um, Donald Moore will be our next Mm -hmm. guest. He's going to come and talk about the Public Community Health Clinic and what they're doing in their expansion. So that should be fun. Um, He's been involved with Action 22 forever and has supported us, and we've supported what he does here. So that'll be exciting to hear about. So join us next week for that. We'll see you then. Thanks.